starting in just a few moments. Um, while we wait, uh, for those comfortable doing so, certainly no obligation, but for those comfortable doing so, uh, let us know in the, in the chat where you're watching from. So if you're comfortable doing so, let Jeffrey, Hank, and I know uh, where you're viewing uh, this from. Okay, let's see. All right, we're getting uh, some, uh, slowly but surely, we're getting some uh, responses in the chat. So again, uh, feel free to let us know where you're watching from. And uh, out of respect for those that are here on time, uh, we'll get started. So my name is Robert Hayes. I'm the Community Outreach Librarian and Head of Technical Services at the Tewksbury Public Library. Uh, absolutely thrilled. I was just saying it's a career highlight uh, for me. Uh, we're hosting best-selling author Jeffrey Archer for a discussion of his latest book, uh, Over My Dead Body. And he's in conversation with best-selling author Hank Philippi Ryan. And um, just, just briefly, uh, Hank and Jeffrey, I'm gonna have you muted, but I'll unmute you uh, momentarily. Uh, so uh, I wanna thank a lot of people, but I'm gonna do it uh, in the chat and in the follow-up email, just to, just to be brief. But I, I did wanna note that uh, autographed copies of Jeffrey's Over My Dead Body uh, as well as Hank's uh, latest uh, thriller, Her Perfect Life, uh, are both available uh, through our bookstore partner, Haley Booksellers, and I'll be putting um, that uh, information in the chat as well. Uh, just as a reminder, we're in Zoom webinar mode, so we cannot hear you or see you. Uh, if you have a question uh, for Jeffrey, you want to type that into the Q&A. Uh, if you have a comment for Jeffrey, you want to type that into the chat. And uh, we will try to address as many questions and comments at the end of the program. Uh, to set expectations, I anticipate uh, this program lasting approximately an hour. Uh, Hank and Jeffrey will have uh, roughly a 45 minute conversation. Uh, and then I uh, will take 15 minutes of questions from the audience, uh, which Hank will select uh, from the chat and from the Q&A box. All right, so let me first introduce Hank. Uh, Hank Philippi Ryan is the USA Today bestselling author of 13 psychological thrillers. She's uh, won the, her genre's most prestigious awards, uh, five Agathas, four Anthonys, and the coveted Mary Higgins Clark Award. Uh, she is also an investigative reporter for Boston's WHTH TV, winning 37 Emmys. Uh, book reviewers call her a master of suspense. Uh, the First to Lie, uh, which was published back in 2020, garnered a publish week Publishers Weekly Star Review and is an Ag uh, Anthony and Mary Higgins Clark Award nominee. And her newest book, which was just published last month, uh, Her Perfect Lie, is a chilling psychological uh, standalone about fame, family, and revenge, uh, which garnered star reviews from Kirkus and Publishers Weekly, uh, which called it a superlative thriller. Uh, and now let me introduce Jeffrey. Uh, Jeffrey Archer is one of the world's best-selling authors with sales of over 270 million copies in 97 countries and is the only author ever to have been a number one bestseller in fiction 20 times, short stories four times, and in nonfiction for The Prisoner Diaries. He was born in London, brought up in the West Country. He gained a blue in athletics at Oxford, was president of the University Athletics Club, and went on to run the 100 yards in 9.6 seconds for Great Britain in 1966. Jeffrey has served five years in the House of Commons as a member of Parliament and 29 years as a member of the House of Lords. Uh, so everyone watching live on Zoom and on Facebook and those that will be uh, watching on demand and on YouTube, Let's give a big virtual round of applause to Jeffrey and Hank for joining us here today. And Hank, you can take it away. Thanks so much. And uh, you'll both actually have to unmute on your end. I do apologize for that. And we can do that. Thank you, Robert, so much. And thank you all for being here this afternoon. This is absolutely exciting. And I'm seeing dozens and dozens and dozens and more than 100 people, uh, almost 200 people are here with us this afternoon. And we are thrilled about that. Jeffrey, welcome. I am in Boston. Where are you? And you know what, Jeffrey? You're still muted. I'm sorry. Look at this. Let me see here. 
Technical difficulties, folks. No, I apologize. this is the suspense. He's a suspense author, right? And this he's keeping us in suspense about what he is going to say. Um, I know this is a one-click thing for Jeffrey that all he has to do, I think, is click the unmute button. But briefly, let me tell you a little bit about Jeffrey's book, Over My Dead Body. Um, which is brand new, just came out. Look at that gorgeous cover. And on the back, it says four cases, four killers, only one man can stop them. Uh, and this is a William Warwick book. If all, if all of you are familiar with William Warwick books, uh, this is the fourth in the series, but I insist this is a standalone. You can read those books in any order. They are glorious suspense clever and fun and witty and wry and smart and terrific puzzles um, with a style that only Jeffrey Archer can do. Jeffrey is such an amazing storyteller and I cannot wait for him to tell you um, all about it. I'm back it. with you. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Um, I, did I get it right? This is, this is the fourth in the, this is the, this is a William Winslow book. You can read them in any order, but this is the brand new one. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I have to tell you, Jeffrey. I have to tell you, Jeffrey. You have put yourself back in 1980, and I was just beginning as a reporter in Atlanta, Georgia, and I picked up Cain and Abel, and it was life changing. It was formative. It was one of the best books I had ever read at that time. It was riveting. And now I read that that alone has sold 34 million copies, um, as many as To Kill a Mockingbird and Gone with the Wind. How, how pivotal was that book in your life? Well, my first book, to be honest, Hank, uh, was turned down by 16 the publishers. Was that and not a penny more? Quiet, I'll tell them. <laughs> okay. It was it was turned down. It's what you get with American women, I remember. Lucky you. <laughs> yes, it was turned down by 17 publishers. The 18th publisher purchased it for about $4,000. It sold 3,000 copies. And I wondered if this was the life I was going to have. And then I wrote a second book, which did a little better. And then, as you rightly say, Hank, the third one, Cain and Abel, uh, just went mad. It, uh, it sold a million in the first week around the world and stayed on the New York Times bestsellers list for 61 weeks. And of course, you're quite right. It totally and completely changed my life. I haven't had to work since, and you're very kind to mention that it sold as many as Gone with the Wind and To Kill a Mockingbird. Uh, but I have worked steadily ever since, and I'm now 81 years old, and I'm still working very hard indeed. Well, what do you, what, how did that change your, your soul as an author to see that success? What do you think you tapped into? Did you realize you were a fabulous storyteller? Did you realize you had this Jeffrey Archer voice that people loved? I think, you know, Hank, I, I'm convinced more and more in old age that storytelling is a gift. You can be a great writer if you're well educated and you're well read. Uh, but to be a storyteller, I do believe it's a gift. You see, I, I don't play the violin. I don't paint a picture. I, I, I don't sing a song. I'm a storyteller and I happen to believe that's a gift, but you still have to work very hard indeed. You only have to look. I always say to young people, go to the ballet. And they say, what are you talking about, Jeffrey? I say, well, if you sit in the theater and watch the prima ballerina, you will re realize how hard I work. And I will promise you, she didn't get there by mistake. It's damned hard work. Now she has a gift, but it's still damned hard work. And you will know as well as anyone, Hank, because of all the books you've read, there is no short cut. Even at my old age, I'm still doing 14 drafts, every one handwritten, and the publisher doesn't get to see it until I've written about the 13th, 14th or 15th draft. I wish it was easier, but it isn't. 
I mean, it's interesting when you talk about wishing it were easier because I think that, that the difficulty of the process, sometimes I tell students, if it's not difficult, you're probably not working hard enough because every word has to work, every scene has to matter, every, every, every choice that you make has to serve the book. And that's something that I think for you also, it's a combination of this talent that you're talking about, this gift that you're talking about, your persistence and your skill and your understanding of the craft. But when you were a, when you were a child, did, did you always tell stories? Were you always a raconteur? I think, yes, and I think when I was a member of parliament, I loved speaking, I loved oratory, I loved words, but I didn't realize at that time when I was a young member of parliament, I entered the House of Commons, the equivalent to your Congress at the age of 29, which frankly was far too young, mm -hmm. but I was already making speeches. I was already enjoying the use and power of words it had never crossed my mind when I left the House of Commons in terrible debt that actually what I would do for the rest of my life would write stories. That came as a big surprise. But then we must remember, Hank, that Proust said, we all end up doing the thing we're second best at. That is really thought provoking because we try something, we fail, and then we try something else. And if we're lucky um, and the timing is right and we work hard, that blossoms into who we were meant to be. I was a television reporter for 33 years before I started writing fiction and it all serves itself. You know, I couldn't be doing what I am now without having done what I did before. So fascinating. But what was the thing at that moment then when you started writing your first book? I mean, you not only at that moment in your life, you not only have to have an idea, but you have to have this sort of confidence or naivete or whatever it is to think I'm going to write a book and I can do it. That is a that is a leap. Yes, you have to be. You're quite right. A complete idiot. To believe, <laughs> believe you can do that. And I was a complete idiot and believed I could do it. Not a penny more, not a penny less was the first book, the story of four young men who between them lose a fortune and they attempt to steal it back in four different ways from the man who stole it from them. But they mustn't go one penny over because that would be stealing. So uh, yes, I thought that was pretty good, Hank. 17 yeah. publishers turned it down, and it was uh, the 18th publisher, and they, as I said, they gave me a check for $4,000, and only 3,000 people bought it, so it wasn't a propitious start. But it was a start. What made you go on, though? It began to pick up across the world, and I think you know a turning point. It's often idiosyncratic tiny things that happen. I was in that tiny shop in New York, the tiny double days. There were two double days in New York, Fifth Avenue, when I was a child, when I was in my thirties. And I went to the second one. And uh, I went to the first one and they only had two copies of my book. Whereas I could see Robert Ludlam piled up by the door. <laughs> and I said to myself, I'm going to be piled up by the door one day. So I went to the other double day and he put, he put it in 10th place and there was no way, Hank, no way it was worthy of being in 10th place. I returned a year later, it was still in 10th place. And I returned a year later and it was still in 10th place. So I had a word with the manager. I said, look, I'm sorry to, I am actually the author of this book and I'm slightly puzzled how the fact that, that the world has forgotten it in a couple of weeks, but you've still got it in 10th place. He said, I think it's among the most original books I've ever read in my life. And as long as I'm managing this store, it will remain in 10th place. And indeed, he left it there for years. And he also told me years later, Hank, it was weird. I saw him when he was an old man and just about to retire. And he said, Jeffrey, I know the world is going mad about Cain and Abel. I know it's going to number one in every country on earth, but I will tell you, not a penny more not a penny less, remains my favorite piece of your work. And that's, you know, that luck and timing and that love 
that love of one person and the word of mouth, the difference that that can make. But then you wake up after Cain and Abel one morning and get a call from who, your editor or agent or someone, publisher, who says, guess what, Jeffrey, about Cain and Abel? What did they tell you? And what? how did you feel at that point? It was a, a lady called Alicia Friedman, who I think at that time was working for Putnam. I could be wrong because it's 40 years ago. And she had come second in the bidding. Uh, the final bidding went to Simon & Schuster for 3,200,000. And I was penniless at the time. Uh, I bought a totally new meaning to the words nouveau riche. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, I she got a call from her and I thought, I genuinely thought she's going to say something not very nice because she didn't get the book. But in fact, she said, Jeffrey, I just wanted to wish you luck and say a year today, everyone will be reading this book. Now I said to my wife, how can she know that a year ahead? And surely sometimes they get worked up about a book and it, and it, and it doesn't happen. In fact, Simon Schuster got so worried that it invested so much in this book that they put on the very great Paulie Smith, a legendary editor, a legendary editor of JD's, of, of Salinger, and uh, I had the privilege of working with one of the great editors on earth on Cain and Abel. And they got so panicky near the day of it coming out that they were thinking of changing the title. And I said, you're nuts. You're completely nuts. And then we walked in out of the lift as I was saying, you're nuts. And the girl on the switchboard turned to say, I really loving this book and what a great title. And that ended the chairman and the managing director having any opinion at all. The girl on the switchboard got it right. Well, that's the reading public, though. That is the reading public, and that's who you reached, and that's who you touched. That's who you touched with this. Um, and, it, and you sort of never have looked back since then. But you know, you have kind of because you did do a rewrite, a re-edition of Cain and Abel for the yes. anniversary. What was yes. that like to open those pages and then decide what to change and well, fix? It, it was a form of vanity, I think, probably, uh, or pride, whichever you wish. I suddenly realized at the age of 60, this book might go on selling after I'm dead because it was still selling quarter of a million copies a year. So I thought I'd like to go back and have a look at it because I knew after 30 years, of writing that I was a better craftsman. I don't think I was, I honestly don't think I was a better storyteller. I mean, you're stuck with that. You, that's, as I always claim, a gift. But I felt I was a better craftsman. I'd done about 15 books. So I, I got at it and I will tell you, the story didn't change one iota. The book that is now in the bookstores is 8,000 words shorter. Uh -huh. It was originally 240,000 words. It's now 232,000 words. And I think that was just 30 years experience. We all, you know, our books are always the best they can possibly be for the time that we write them. But we have to raise the bar on ourselves. We have to challenge ourselves to write a better and better book. But wow, that must have been an experience to go back through this perfect book that you thought at the time that sold billions of copies and change it. What was the what was the reaction to it? Did you get a whole nother wave of people buying it? Well, they didn't know. <laughs> I mean, it was announced that I'd done it, but people buying it now buy the book and they don't know that 20 years after the original copy, I'd sat down and done a rewrite. So what you get is you get the modern version of Cain and Abel and they don't know. And because I've, I had a, a letter last week from a 12 year old in India who's just read Cain and Abel. So this all happened even before she was born. That's so sweet. It's really lovely. Talk about a legacy. I want to get to your book. Uh, if you just joined us, we're, jo we're talking with Jeffrey Archer about his brand new fabulous thriller, Over My Dead Body, which is absolutely unputdownable, and we will not have any spoilers today. Um, but when you, when you started evolving as an author and you somehow captured this lightning in a bottle of your talent for storytelling and you moved on to other stories. What came next in your career? Well, I think I should say before that, Hank, I had a bit of luck because you said earlier 
and I listened to the way you said it. Sometimes you need a bit of luck as well. I'd been trooping round the country with Cain and Abel in the days, and you're not old enough to know, but you were probably on television at the time, in the days when poor authors like us had to go to 18 cities in America and get on the breakfast show first thing in the morning. <laughs> if you're plug, lucky. <laughs> plug, plug, and I was plug, plug, plugging, and I got the book the the, after three weeks, the book was at about number 17, 16, somewhere around there. And my publishers, Simon and Schuster, weren't exactly excited. And then they rang up and said, uh, we've got a break, Jeffrey. You're on a show we hadn't booked you for, but they're asking for you. And I, they said, could you please, you know, do a little better this time? You know, this is your chance. So I was in California and I was in Los Angeles and I went to the studio and uh, there was a snake charmer on in front of me. So I wasn't exactly overwhelmed by what might happen. And uh, I sat down opposite this very well-dressed, very distinguished looking gentleman who held up the book and said, I, I got a hold of this three days ago and I couldn't put it down. And I say to every one of you, go and buy this book. It will change your life. And I'd like to thank Mr. Johnny Carson because of that. <laughs> The book went to number one the week after. So I think, I think, Hank, the point you made about needing a bit of luck, you do, something has to happen that makes everybody suddenly rush to the bookstores. Yeah. I can hear his voice saying that, that droll Johnny Carson voice. And listen, you all, you, you heard Jeffrey tell that story. That is perfect suspense. That well, is it, was, perfect. it was terrible. I, had a, I was on a year later when I wrote the follow-up book. And I hadn't, re I realized then how very important he was, number one. And I then realized then how bright he was and why he'd got to number one. Because he said to me, um, how nice to have you back, Jeffrey. And you've now written The Prodigal Daughter, the follow-up to Cain and Abel, the story of the first woman president of the United States. By the way, for those Americans listening, that was 40 years ago. We've had two prime ministers and you've ended up with Trump and Biden. Are you not telling me out there in 280 million women, there isn't someone as good as Trump or Biden? Because I don't believe it. Still, I was sitting opposite Mr. I was sitting opposite, uh, I was sitting opposite the great man. And he said, <clears throat> I've been reading in the papers, Jeffrey, <clears throat> that Cain and Abel has been very successful. And I said, well, uh, frankly, greatly part to you, Mr. Carson. I'm very grateful. No, no, I've been reading. You're now really doing very well indeed. And I said, well, again, I said, well, and he said, no, the reason I asked Jeffrey, and he then flashed up on the screen, me the year before, sitting opposite him. He said, no, I just wondered why you were wearing the same suit, the same shirt and the same tie. <laughs> and I thought, what a pro. I mean, what a pro. They couldn't have seen me till I come in the studio and they got that up in the two or three minutes. And you will know as a television lady that that's class. That's yes. doing your professional job. And of course he, he, he just, well, he was, and he was a very generous and kind man and I haven't forgotten. It's but. also connection. It, it's also connection and it's also caring about what you do. It's not just performing, but it's being in the moment and being a professional in every way about your guests and your role and your and the and, and what you owe to your audience who watches you every day. So out well, I'm not so sure about that, Hank. When I arrived first in the United States of America, and when I've been many times, I've been having a love affair with America for 40 years. I am one of my closest friends is Bill Bradley, who I was at Oxford with oh. and and gave and gave the speech at my uh, 30th wedding anniversary that's and was was one of my ushers at my wedding so I've been in I've had a, an affair with America for 30 years but when I first arrived to do my first television show on Good Morning America they told me you I was on with I was on with Jimmy Carter's brother who was promoting Billy's beer mm -hmm. and Mickey Mouse they were the two people I was on with and I was told I got four minutes, the 12 minutes segment, four minutes each. Mickey Mouse took about four and a half minutes and Billy Carter selling his beer took a four and a half. I was down to about three minutes before I sat down. 
So I sat down in front of this very professional man, and as he picked up the book, Hank, it was clear to me, not only he hadn't read it, he hadn't even opened the cover of Cain and Abel. So I knew we were off to a bad start, but still, I, I'm, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm, I'm ready. And he says, and he's looking at my sheet to see who I am and what I've done. So he said, oh, hi, Jeff, not a good start, Hank. But then I took all this on, on the nose, this is no problem. He said, hi, Jeff, I see you came over on the Concorde. And I said, yes, this is an amazing airplane. It flies twice the height of any airplane, commercial airplane in the world. It flies twice the speed of any commercial airplane in the world. If you take off in London, you can have breakfast before you take off. And when you land in New York, you can have breakfast again. This is an achievement of British engineering of which I am immensely proud, to which the interviewer said, it's been lovely having you on the show, Jeffrey. My publishers were not pleased. They didn't actually feel I'd pushed Cain and Abel quite hard enough. So my beginning as a television, whatever you call it, uh, interviewee was not rated by my publishers. And I was told in future not to mention Concord. <laughs> You know, that's the risk that you take of being an internationally best-selling author. So let's not take that risk now. Let's make your publishers happy and talk about over my dead body so we so we don't have to stand in the corner. Um, this, you all, I, I got this book three days ago and it is life-changing and you should all go get this right now. Um, it, it is a terrific, I was trying to imitate Johnny Carson. Um, this is a terrific page turner of a book, the fourth of the William Warwick series. Um, talk a little bit about this book. Just quickly on the back, it says four cases, four killers, only one man can stop them. Just tell us a little bit about the plot before we get into how you did it. Well, it arose in a very strange way. I wrote a series called The Clifton Chronicles, which, thank you, America, you were very kind about and put to number one on the New York Times bestsellers list. And uh, I did that between the age of 70 and 77. And I started getting a lot of letters saying that Harry Clifton, the hero of the Clifton Chronicles, was a writer. So he was loosely based on me, married to uh, Emma, who is loosely based on my remarkable wife, who is currently chairman of the Science Museum in Great Britain. And you'll be horrified to hear Hank is the first woman in the history of our country to chair a national museum or gallery. She ought to be about the 30th, but she's the first. So it was very personal and, and very much, I felt I was the writer, she was my wife. And then lots of people started writing saying, Harry Clifton's hero is William Warwick. We'd like to hear about him. And these letters were coming in all the time, so I took it seriously. And I decided I'm not going to write a detective story. I'm going to write a story about a detective. So I have him at school when he's young and he wants to go into the Metropolitan Police Force. But his father, a distinguished QC, what you would call a senior counsel, mm -hmm. uh, doesn't want him to. He wants him to go to Oxford and read law and join him in what we call chambers. He didn't want to, and he defies his father, goes into the policeman, goes into the Metropolitan Police as a copper on the beat. Now, the second decision, Hank, was the next big one. I was determined to write eight books with him at a different rank in every book, covering a different subject in every book. Book. So book one, he's a copper on the beat. He gets transferred to the art and antique squad and as a young detective constable is responsible for trying to find a stolen Rembrandt. That's book number one. Book number two is drugs. Book number three is police corruption. And you have book number four, which you rightly say, is over my dead body. It's four 
uh, unsolved murders and the commander puts William Warwick in charge of solving them because he says if someone gets away with murder, they might do it again. Now, here's the problem, Hank. He's now a chief inspector. He's gone from constable to detective sergeant, to detective inspector, to detective chief, super, chief inspector. He's got to go four more books. He's got to go superintendent, chief superintendent, commander, commissioner of the Metropolitan Police. Now, here's the problem. I've got to live. Nowhere. I have no, absolutely no doubt that he will make it to commissioner because William Warwick is a remarkable man. But I have to live to the age of 86 if he's going to get into the office of the commissioner of the Metropolitan Police. Well, you've been very successful at everything else that you've done. So you will be successful at this as well. What I love about the William Warwick thing, that you, the character that you, that you wrote a story about, not a detective story, but a story about a detective, um, is a real secret of yours. Because I think it shows that how well you understand that readers want a great story, completely want a great story, but they also want a character who they care about and who they can root for and latch on to. How did you create him um, with that in mind? One of the problems I have, and I wonder, Hank, if you have it as well, is that you have to know your limitations. I'm an Englishman, and I, I stick to writing very simple, old-fashioned stories uh -huh. with a beginning, a middle, and an end. And I keep to that. And I wonder when the day will come when they say, oh, poor old thing, he's passed it. It's another of those old fashioned stories with no swearing, no bad language, no violence. He just expects us to turn the page. And as long as the Americans go on buying my books, as do so many people across the world, I shall go on telling simple stories. So the answer to your question is, I say to young people, stick to what you know about. If you're going to write a novel, write about the experiences you've had and how they fit into your life. And the reader will say, wow, that feels authentic and true. Don't write a ghost story because you think you have to. Don't write a sex story because you think you have to. Don't write a violent story because you think you have to. Write what you want to write and pray that the public will enjoy it. Well, you, you do spin a wonderful story, a wonderful page turning story where we can't wait to hear what happens next. I agree with you. And one of the things I enjoy about, one of the many things I enjoy about your books is I don't have graphic sex in my books either. I don't have graphic violence. I don't have inappropriate language. I just want a page turning story that makes people miss their stop on the train because they are so involved in what's going to happen. What I love about your books is you're, you have this Jeffrey Archer style. It's witty, it's worldly, it's knowledgeable, it's smart, it's, it's fun to read. And only an insider like you would know about the art world and the, the etiquette at the captain's table on a cruise. It's, you know, you talk about being genuine and authentic. Talk about a little bit about that. Well, that, that's a very good point you make. It goes back to the point I make. You must write about what you know about. Mm -hmm. So I've been collecting art for 50 years. I'm a huge lover of art. My home is covered in pictures. I just love them. My wife says there's no more walls to put them on. They're in cupboards, you silly man. Of course she's right, but I can't. I just love it. And of course, there's a lot of politics in my book because I've been a member of the House of Commons and I'm now a member of the House of Lords. I love the United States and its amazing system with uh, Congress and the Senate. I have many friends in both houses, so that gets in as well. I'm a charity auctioneer. That's my hobby. I've done 1,100, over 1,100 charity auctions in my life, raising approximately $100 million. And, but that's a hobby. So that gets into the book as well. As you were kind enough to point out, I had the privilege and honor of running for my country. So sport gets into my books as well. So I say to people, write about what you feel easy with, what you feel relaxed about. The public will know you love art. The public will know you understand politics. The public 
will know you do auctions. They'll feel it when they read it. Don't suddenly say, I'm now going to talk, I'm going to have a ghost story, because uh, I'd be lost doing a ghost story, because I've never seen a ghost. Well, that's why your books, the the dialogue and the stories in your in your novels come out is so so seamless. Although I know it's very difficult to write. And another thing that I love is how is William Oreck's voice, his manner. It, there, he sets up puzzles for people and sort of takes the measure of the people around him by how much they observe and what they know and their analytical minds. Um, and he he allows the readers to solve the puzzles along the way as well. And that's really fun. Is that fun to write? Well, again, I would have to admit that's based on someone. It's based on a man called Chief Superintendent John Sutherland, who was head of the murder squad at Scotland Yard. And he sadly had to leave the police because he had a mental breakdown, what he described as one murder too many. And I went to see him. I actually first saw him in the Advent Carol concert for the Lords and the Commons, and I asked them if he would be kind enough to be my researcher so that when I finished the book, I could hand it to him and he would point out all the mistakes I'd made, all the things I'd done wrong, and give me the odd anecdotal story about his life in the police force. Now, he was tipped to become commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, so I wickedly stole him as a character and I'm now taking him through to the job he didn't get and he's remained on my team along with a remarkable woman who was Detective Sergeant Michelle Roycroft who had 30 years, now retired, 30 years in the drug squad. So the two of them between them are watching that I don't make mistakes and I'll give you an example if I may Hank of how easy it is for an author to make a mistake. There's a murder in the book you've got there over my dead body where the commander orders William to put 10 men onto William Warwick to put 10 men onto it straight away. My senior policeman said, Jeffrey, I never had 10 men to put onto it straight away. I was jolly lucky if I had two men I could put on to it. And it's mistakes like that that authors can make. And a policeman wrote to me only a couple of weeks ago and said, lovely touch that, because he realized, of course, that John Sutherland had pointed out that he could only put two men onto it. And it is all over the world, in your country as well as mine, a great problem for the policing system is that crime at such so many levels, there often just aren't enough officers to deal with it. But those two, I'm happy to say, have, I hope, ironed out any silly mistakes I might have made along the way. Well, it's truly a joy to read. And now all of you listeners uh, know the secret behind two of Jeffrey's characters. And that is marvelous. But do, though, Jeffrey, tell us a little bit quickly about the plot of this. So people who are just saying, oh, I wonder what this is about. Tell them a little bit about this that. One. This one opens with the commander telling his small team, led by William Warwick, that there are four unsolved murders, and the commissioner is worried that all four of them could well commit another murder because they think they've got away with it. And so he's given the lousy job of proving they know who got away with it. They know who the four people are. They just can't prove it. And they've got to find out. And he has in it a remarkable team of four young people and they're given one each while he's the overseer. And then the shock comes that the four of them are connected. And that's when the twists become to come one after <laughs> each other. And indeed they do, and indeed they do. And the art theft element in it as well is quite diabolical. The you'll read when you read it, and I, when you all read this, and I know you will, um, you'll understand the double meaning, at least double meaning, maybe triple meaning of over my dead body, which is just a, a perfect, a perfect title. Talk a little bit why there's this why there's this uh, frame and looking like a painting on. The well, cover. I think I think the frame is there because there's so uh, quite a bit about art in it, both in the United States and in Britain, about art and collecting art and art crime. And over my dead body is an English saying, as I'm sure and hope it is, in the United States of America. Mind you, 
I had a problem with one of my books, Hank. I had what I thought was a wonderful title and the uh, Americans turned it down because they said it wasn't a saying in their country. I'm now going to tell you what that title was, which I was made to change. The title was In the Lap of the Gods. And they said to me, I thought that was a wonderful title. And they said, no, the Americans will never understand that, Jeffrey. You'll have to change it. And it was changed to what I didn't think a title in the same class. But so when one's going well, out, What was it changed to? Oh, that's a jolly good question. I have to, <laughs> yes, but it wasn't as well, we'll all look that up. We'll all look that up. I mean, in the lap of the gods sounds like fate um, and control. Yes. yes. We, know, we know that phrase. I think yes. it's probably. Well, no, they didn't, they didn't think they were all as intelligent as you. This was the problem. <laughs> they, well, let's I thought, talk about, you know, I, I thought they were. You, you know, when you have a good publisher, you just say, that's good, that's fine, I love this, the cover is beautiful, and this title, at least, um, is perfection, absolute perfection, because there is some discussion over whether someone actually is dead, and that's another element and another scheme of the novel. Was that fun to write? Oh, yes. I, I, I never know what's coming on the next page. I never know what's coming in the next chapter, and it just became more and more fun as we got near the end and I could see how the four were linked up and how I could see that Miles Faulkner was connected with them and they had to get finally get Miles Faulkner. Uh, yes, that was uh, terrific fun. Uh, I have to confess, when it stops being fun, Hank, I'm gonna stop myself. I'm loving it at the moment. I'm on the next book now, which I have done about six drafts and it's Royal Protection. And we're going to follow the royal family and the way the police protect them and the problems they face because of that. So I will have moved on to another subject and he will be then, William Warwick will be a superintendent. So I know where the next one is going. Well, I can't wait to read that. You send that to me right away as soon as that's finished. I hear, do you ever have though, you say, if it's not fun, do you ever have a day when you're writing and I know that your process is so intense and you're and you're so diligent about it and I'd love to hear about that. But, and do you also ever have a day where you think, eh, you know, I'm not so sure. No, you don't, <laughs> You, it's always wonderful. No. I confess that I think I'm very lucky. I, I wrote from six to eight this morning, from 10 till 12, and from six to seven this evening because I was coming on your show. And it's been a wonderful day. There's a particular scene that I've been worried about uh, where they're all in, in the office and they realize that William is in trouble and might even be arrested. And I couldn't say a way, see a way around it. And I woke up at three o'clock this morning, got up at 5.30 and Wow, it just came flooding out. So, wow. no, I can't complain, Hank, and have I, my home in Mallorca, where I do the first three drafts, is called Writer's Block, but I can't pretend that I've ever suffered from it. Um, someone in the comments, Robert, is saying that In the Lap of the Gods became Sons of Fortune. Correct. So now well done, the next. Robert. Week. I well knew done, you were there for some reason, Robert. <laughs> We've now discovered what it is. You're well, quite right. He's not laughing yet. You're no, quite right. I'm going to get him to laugh. You're no, that's a, still, right. that's a still photo. It's a still photo. I'm so if you can get that still photo to laugh. We're, I'm you, laughing, Jeffrey. I'm okay, laughing. Okay, he's laughing. He's laughing. <laughs> and I do, I do see the your questions, all of you coming in, and we will get to that in about in about two in about two minutes. Um, but I do want to ask you though, um, when you were talking about writing in Mallorca, and you said that there you had you you weren't worried about writer's block. And I and I was taken by what you said about you don't know what's going to happen until you write the next line and the next scene. And I write that way too. Um, is that fun for you that you sit down at the computer and you don't know what's going to happen next? Well, it's a hell of a risk. Yeah. In, uh, in uh, the Clifton Chronicles, I had the Wicked Lady Virginia in the witness box. And I decided that morning that the Wicked Lady Virginia was gonna be killed, smashed to death by the leading QC in the country. He would defeat her. And he got up, I got up at 5.30, I picked the pen up, I had her in the witness box, you're gonna be beaten, Lady Virginia, I'm gonna hammer you. And the, the lawyer asked her a question and she brushed it to one side. And I thought, oh. oh. So I tried another question and she brushed it to one side. And I tried a third question, she killed the lawyer. And I realized <laughs> I, I didn't actually get up 
that morning with that intention. The pen went that way. So my heroine, Emma, had to be the loser in court and my villain, Lady Virginia, won the case. But when I read it, it read, that was right. It just went that way and I thought it can stay that way. I have to get myself out of that problem. What do you think about that? What do you what do you think about that? Is that out of the problem? No, what about your is that your subconscious? Is that your writer brain? Is that you allowing the the real true story to come through, recognizing it? How, How do you think about that process? I love it. I love it. And I pray that it will happen every single day. And when I get up in the morning, I say, am I going to be allowed to do it again? So, yes, I love it. That brings tears to my eyes. That is wonderful. Am I going to be allowed to do it again? That is, I'm going to write that down and and put that on my wall. Uh, We do have uh, so many questions for you. When I look over here, you'll see that I'm looking at all the comments of all the people who are coming in more and more people now. I see um, Joyce and Robin and Barbara and Bonnie and Sue and Steve. You should look at the comments when this is over because there's so much joy and so much admiration and so much... um, love coming for from your readers for you and I and I don't want you to miss that so let's look at the questions do you mind taking a few questions from the audience now and we'll see yes, what, what your readers yes, want please. to know all right um, uh, uh, Teresa wants to know what is the best piece of writing advice you've received that you still use in your own writing that there is no substitute for hard work that you may, I, I, I saw a young journalist recently, who was one of the most respected journalists in our country, and he'd handed, he couldn't understand why the book hadn't gone to, num- his book hadn't gone to number one, until he told me he'd only done one draft. And I said, you know, the first draft is the first draft, uh, and you've still got to go on working and working, and for a journalist that's difficult, because they're used to doing a thousand words overnight, mm-hmm. handing it in and seeing it in the paper the next day. So it's very difficult for them to actually believe they'll have to do 10, 15 drafts. And I handwrite every word. So it's a slow process. I wish I could find a shortcut, but I can't. Uh, So I intend to go on sticking to the boring routine. So I'll say to the lady, the best piece of advice I've ever had is you don't get anywhere without hard work. I once met the great Sir Vivian Pritchard a great uh, poet in our country, a great short story writer. And I said, I'm worried, sir. I was a young man at the time. I said, I'm worried, sir, that my books are taking 16 drafts. And he said, mine take 21, Jeffrey. I wouldn't get worried. And I think that taught me he didn't get there just being very good. How do you know when you're finished? Uh, Good question. A good question. The last draft, frankly, Hank, will have a word change in every page, perhaps a new sentence every 10 pages and a new paragraph every 30 or 40 pages. You know, then you better hand the damn thing in uh, because, you know, this could go on forever. In fact, my wife always says if I go into a bookshop, she won't let me anywhere near my books because I might pick them up and start putting another word in. And I, I guess I can see from your expression, you've had the same problem. When you start changing and to but, and then back yes, again, yes. or putting in this, well, that little thing. I know that- However, uh, the buts. Yes, exactly, exactly. I, I write exactly the same way, although not in handwriting, because I would not be able to read my handwriting if I tried to write it write it down. Um, but, I, but I know I'm finished when I, I'm looking at a draft, and I, I forget that I wrote it. I'm just reading the story. And I think, okay, okay, I think you're done. And sort of tears come to my eyes a little bit because there's a moment where you, it feels satisfying that, that, there's, that you yes, have to- Yes, well, that's, that's partly because you're a romantic old fool, Hank. I can, see the tears, I can see the tears coming down all the time. You're that sort of woman. But mind you, don't be ashamed of that. That's part of being a storyteller. Uh, I, well, I do embrace that, and, and thank you. Neil wants to know, I'm impressed with your variety of expertise. How can a person be a master of so many things? What's your secret? Well, I think the secret is I'm not a master. I'm, I'm, I'm a dilettante who loves many things. I read a lot. I go to the theater twice a week. I love films. 
I, I love art galleries and I never stop. Uh, uh, when you first came on this evening, Hank, chattering to Robert, I heard you say, I'll be with him in another eight minutes. So I left the room, got an art book that's just been sent to me and studied it for those eight minutes. So I would say to anyone who asks that question, don't waste any time. That is, that's really valuable advice. Um, and there's also the moment though, where you must, where your writer brain has to take all that in and sort of figure out how all the puzzle pieces go together. Let me just rewind a little bit to ask. So- No, oh. no, no. If I had any idea at all, that's, that's trying to think it through clearly, Hank. If I did <laughs> oh, yeah, we that, wouldn't get that, you wouldn't get a book. I pick up the pen and go once upon a time and pray. <laughs> it's funny because uh, my editor has asked me uh, several times, couldn't you just send us an outline? And I say, no, because Good. how do I know what happened until it happens? Quite. And it happens in the book. Yes, a yes, future editor. Yes, quite right. Exactly. All right. So uh, let me see. Bonnie is asking, any chance of a modern day Cain and Abel? No. Not not. <laughs> but I will tell you, uh, did you say, Bonnie, did you say? Yes. Bonnie, Bonnie, uh, Bonnie, I wrote a book which you'd enjoy if that's what you're looking for. I'm a huge admirer of Alexander Dumas. And I, after a review in the Washington Post by the professor of English at Georgetown University, when he said Britain has found the new Alexander Dumas, don't let's forget he was French, Britain has found the new Alexander Dumas, I wrote a modern version of the Count of Monte Cristo called A Prisoner of Birth. And I tried to write the story in mo uh, what you asked for, Barney, in modern day terms, which was a tremendous challenge because Jumara is among the greatest storytellers that's ever lived. I see that on the back of on the back of your book. That is that is oh, quoted. That, that quote from the Washington Post. Yes. And I wondered what you thought when you saw that, because you know that is quite a high bar. Uh, that is time for tears. Uh, that's your, because you're a sentimental I, person, well, right? I, well, I'm a sentimental romantic. I remember walking through the streets of Bangalore and. And uh, I, I, they, I heard cheering in, in the background. And I was heading towards the, uh, sorry, Jaipal, the Jaipal Book Festival. And uh, the person with me assumed I knew that the crowd of 8,000 people were waiting for me. And I didn't. I never had 8,000 people wait for me anywhere. Uh, and in I walked onto the stage and these 8,000 people rose and cheered. And I burst into tears. They, in, in, in India, a hundred million people have read Cain and Abel. Uh, and it's just weird. I mean, it's just completely and absolutely. In fact, I was coming into, I was coming into an airport uh, when, when uh, the, my last book came out, not this one, the one before COVID. And I was in a car and they, what they do, they're very wicked in India. They get the book and then they, they got it on the streets 48 hours later for a third of the price. And this little boy was coming up to my car. He was about seven. He was coming up to my car with a pile of books and he tapped on my window. I was in the car going in to Mumbai and I wound the window down and he said, uh, would you like the latest Jeffrey Archer? And I said, I am the latest Jeffrey Archer. <laughs> That's a fantastic story. That is hilarious. Only, oh, that could only happen to you. That could only happen to you. Um, Neil, another, uh, no, it's the same Neil. I've been a fan of Jeffrey Archer since my teenage days, when you were both teenagers. I still remember the first novel, the novel, Shall We Tell the President? Uh, Do you remember, Neil wants to know, how you came up with that plot? Well, that's very interesting because uh, it's now been, I had to rewrite that one as well because uh, I decided to put it with a woman president. You see, I didn't think your country would take, after Margaret Thatcher, I had the honor of working with Margaret Thatcher for 11 years and uh, being a close, I like to believe, a close personal friend. So uh, we always considered that America would have had a woman president years ago. I mean, she couldn't believe you were taking so long to get a woman president, neither could I. So uh, shall we tell the president is now uh, 
a sort of the third book in the Clifton Chronicles series, where you see Florentina Cain become president of the United States, and you find out that there's a plot to assassinate her, but they won't tell her. The Secret Service are determined to stop it, but they don't let the, the president know that it just could happen. So that idea again, most good ideas, Hank, can be told in one sentence. Yes, I, I I agree. And when you hear that, when you hear, I mean, what you want a reader to say is, ooh, I, I really want to read that. That sounds great. And and that's a good idea. Oh. Well, Cain and Abel, classic on that. I mean, this, Cain and Abel is the story of two men born on the same day. One has everything. One has nothing. They only meet once and it changes their whole life. 600 pages later, you find out why. And it's, it is, it is, well, I told you, it, it was life-changing for me, formative for me. We have a couple of questions about, and, and Florentina reminded me of this, a couple of questions about how you choose your characters' names. Oh, that's a very good question. And I'm bound to say, whoever you two are, because I haven't got your names. Uh, what I do is I go to a television screen, I wait to the end, and when the credits are coming up, I press a button and stop the screen. And there's 20 women's names and 20 men's names and 40 surnames. So I take Kate from that side and Hampton from that side and Bill from that side, William and Warwick from that side. And there they are all for me. They kindly set up on the screen. It only takes me a quarter of an hour to write down on a piece of paper about six names and then I look at them. But the name has to be, it has to indicate how you feel about the person. Yeah. So, uh, Harry Clifton, a good man. William Warwick, a good man. Cain and Abel, two very different men from different parts of the world. The name must feel right. So you have a villain. My villain in, in Over My Dead Body is Miles Faulkner. Why it's a wonderful name for a villain because he's highly intelligent, highly sophisticated, and he's every bit as bright as the police. So you need a name that indicates that. So when they see the name Miles Faulkner, it's not Sid Grafton, it's Miles Faulkner. And so you should get a, I think names are very important. Well, the characters, the characters don't come alive until they have the right name. Yes, I think that's right. Uh, then you'll have to explain yourself. I realize this is near the end of the show, but when I was told I was being interviewed by someone called Hank, I assumed it was sort of one, uh, what we would call in our country, a forward in American football, who'd come off the pitch to interview me, and there's suddenly a beautiful woman in front of me. So please explain. Uh, I'm, I'm, is it Philippi or Philippi? Philippi. 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 Yes, of course, Philippi. Well, I happen to think Philip is a very nice name, thank you. And I refuse to call you Hank. Well, thank you. Um, my real name, uh, now you all are going to know this because Jeffrey's getting me to tell you this. My real name is Harriet. And I was, as a little girl, I was so bookish and so unpopular. And all the, all the cool girls were Debbie and Linda. And to be Harriet in that milieu was awful. And when I went to college on the first day of college, someone who I do not know said, you don't look like a Harriet, we'll call you Hank. And that's, I don't even remember who that was. And I've been Hank ever since. I agree well, with I you. I think that's ridiculous. I think that's quite ridiculous. I think I've never heard anything so ridiculous. Harriet's a lovely name. It and is Harriet indeed. Ryan, dare, shush, dare I say, Harriet Ryan has a real class about it. You think, wow, she'd be able to write. You got that one wrong, Hank. You should be Harriet Ryan. Yes, sir. I will change it instantly. I will call my publisher right now and say, we got it wrong. Jeffrey Archer says it's all wrong. Let's have another go at this. And we will indeed do that. And at that moment, we are out of time. You have come up with a big finish on your own. I wish we could be together much longer. You are completely charming and absolutely wonderful. I'm cl closing the questions now. Uh, let's get this off the screen. And here we go. Um, thank you. Let's do it again. You have to leave, but let's leave let's the audience. Let's do it again. I'd like, to do, I'd like to do another show with Harriet Ryan. Thank you very much indeed. Goodbye, Americans. I love you.
that and that is and that is with those words we leave you we leave jeffrey archer please look for over my dead body it is it is terrific it is immersive it is witty and charming and perplexing and a surprise around every corner i highly recommend it jeffrey archer thank you so much for being with us this afternoon and thank you all for spending your saturday afternoon with us i hope you had as much fun as we did and we will see you next time